So to take us off and start us off here, we have um, my partner and uh, colleague, Dr. Carmen, from University Hospitals, Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. She'll be speaking on how to differentiate and manage venous edema, lymphedema, and lipedema in eight minutes. <laughs> Good morning. So I have no relevant disclosures, but as you can imagine, this is a very big topic for eight minutes. So we're gonna see pretty much a 10,000 foot overview. So my first case that we're gonna talk about, this is a 56 year old lady. She came to the clinic for leg swelling, not an uncommon vascular medicine uh, complaint. It has been very long standing. She saw her primary care doc that uh, he started uh, diuretics, but that really didn't impact the swelling. She is obese. She has a history of DVT at the age of 35 while she was pregnant. That's her only venous thromboembolic event. And she doesn't have any real underlying cardiopulmonary liver or renal disease. So my first question to you is what's demonstrated by each of these pictures? These are very common presentations in the vascular medicine clinic. Does anybody know what the first picture is? Say it again. Lymphedema? This is actually lipedema. This is lipedema, and we'll talk a little bit about lipedema. What about the second picture? That is the more classic lymphedema. And then the third picture, we all see a lot of, right? This is venous insufficiency. So how do we differentiate these? Well, typically, just based by history and a good clinical exam and knowing the clinical findings, we can make a preliminary diagnosis. Now, overlap syndromes are very common, particularly late in the disease course, and we'll talk a little bit about that in one of our most common presentations. Imaging with a venous insufficiency scan or lymphocentigraphy or sometimes CTV or MRV, MRI, really is to help direct therapy, not as much of a diagnostic tool, although it can certainly help with diagnosis. So here's our clinical challenge. Where, what's one thing that helps us in all of these patients? Well, it's what's going on at the foot. So in lipedema, we have a spared foot and we have what's called the ankle cuff or ankle cutoff sign, where that swelling stops abruptly just at the malleoli. In lymphedema, we'll have a dorsal hump. Later in disease, we'll have a positive stemmer sign, which is the inability to pinch the skin at the base of the second toe. There's no tenting, there's no uh, ability to tent that up because of the deep fibrosis, and then squared toes. They lose their normal contour. And in venous insufficiency, the feet are fe frequently spared. You may have minimal swelling, particularly late in the day, but it's not a persistent or fixed swelling. Mm -hmm. The next comes at what happens at the calf, or at what we call the gator area. So in lipedema, this is very symmetrical swelling, if you will, it's not really swelling, it's adipose. It's very doughy, and if you feel deeply, you'll feel what we call peas and pebbles, very small nodules under the skin. In lymphedema, or, uh, you'll have early pitting, but as the disease becomes more fixed, the skin will be very brawny and indurated. You may have secondary hyperkeratosis, papillomatosis, uh, changes of the skin. And then in venous insufficiency, we'll see lipodermatosclerosis and hemosiderin staining, that typical inverted champagne bottle appearance of the legs. We have other clinical conditions that we talk about. In lipedema, these patients will have frequent easy bruising. They'll have a relatively normal upper body with these very heavy legs. They may have cool skin, and it's very tender. They don't want you to squeeze this or touch this deeply. In lymphedema, this disease may be primary or secondary, most frequently secondary, related to either a malignancy or a surgery or some recurrent infections. It's usually painless, and they are absolutely at risk for recurrent infections. They'll frequently tell you about multiple bites, bouts of cellulitis. In venous insufficiency, we we'll can see varicose veins, what we call coronaflebectatica, or that crown of veins at the ankle. They may have secondary skin changes of dermatitis, not just the lipodermatosclerosis, and they're very tender. And they'll tell you about hosty symptoms, heaviness, aching, stingling, titch tingling, itching. Those are the type of symptoms they're gonna report. One of our most common overlap symptoms is, or syndromes is what we call phlebolymphedema. 
This is where we have such long-standing chronic venous hypertension that the lymphatics are secondarily involved. And now we have characteristics of both. So we'll have those typical skin changes, but we also have this very fibrotic skin, secondary lymphatic damage with the dorsal hump, the squared toes, et cetera. So how do we take care of these people? Well, first we educate them. They have to understand what they're dealing with. They have to understand the disease process, and they have to understand how to take care of it. Conservative care with emollients, keratolytic agents, taking care of the skin is very important. Decongestion to get rid of the swelling. We can do this through manual lymphatic drainage. We can do this with sequential compression pumps. We can do this with multi-layer wraps and, and compression. Compression is our mainstay. Usually stockings, but many patients can't use stockings, so we'll use Velcro wraps or multi-layer dressings. Medications may play a role, but this is not diuretics. This is not swelling that's responsible uh, or responsive to relieving intravascular volume because it's not related to liver disease or renal disease or some underlying cardiopulmonary process. They're not volume overloaded. They're volume displaced. Micronized pyronide flavonoid fraction may have a role to help with the inflammation and the tenderness. It's not commonly used in this country. And then procedures, such as ablative procedures for the veins, liposuction, debulking procedures, um, and there are more advanced lymphatic uh, procedures that sometimes these patients will benefit from. So when we think about lipedema, lymphedema, and venous insufficiency, these are not typically very hard to diagnose. They are very often confused in the clinic but they do have very characteristic findings that we just discussed. So our take home points, history and clinical exam is usually a pretty good differentiator. You can get the knowledge you need to, to differentiate this. Education, emollients and compression always are first line and mainstay for these, these patients. And then imaging, medication, sequential pumps, manual lymphatic drainage, even surgery, is going to play a role in management of some, not all, but some of these patients. And with that, I thank you for your attention. OK, great. Excellent summary um, of, of a very broad uh, group of disease disorders. Um, we, why don't we, uh, so we'll go a panel discussion now. So questions from our panelists. Or the audience. So the audience, too, will have some mics going around, so um, please feel free to ask questions. I, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I think the biggest um, challenge is when we see a patient with phlebolymphedema, and I have a lot of those patients, and we find on the venous mapping they have significant venous insufficiency, or when you look at their legs, they have significant lymphedema. How do we tell those patients um, about the result of venous ablation, meaning I tell them there's 50-50 chance of your swelling improving, there's 40, 60, 10, 90, and to be honest with you, when I see those patients, I, I give them all the percentages because I cannot gauge which is causing the swelling more. Is it the lymphatic system or the venous system? What, what do we tell our patients? So I think in those patients, addressing the underlying venous disease is very important. Ultimately, compression and managing the lymphedema is also equally important. And many of those patients will get better, right? Um, without some degree of intervention, we also expect them to get worse, right? We know the natural history of venous disease is progression of disease. So it, it makes sense to still take that multimodal approach. I just don't think you can make any promises. And it does depend on how much the lymphatics are damaged, whether this is a um, just an impairment or if it's completely reversible or, or partially reversible, but I think they do get better with, with some degree of, of aggressive management for sure. So, uh, Carmen, so patients with deep vein insufficiency and lymphedema, what's your approach to that? Yeah, so those are a lot harder. Um, I, I, we still take a multi a multifaceted approach. I think looking to see if there's any proximal outflow disease that could be contributing to the deep insufficiency. Again, will it get better with treatment? You, you don't always have a guarantee, but I think it is one approach. Um, 
you know, coming through the pipeline, will our um, newer valves and things that are coming down the pipeline, will that be an indication at some point? I think it's a better indication for patients with ulcers and more terminal venous disease, but I think it's going to be an expanding field in, from that perspective. Um, and again, it's compression and it's um, not, not necessarily always completely successful. You know, weight loss also plays a big role. Many of these patients that have concomitant disease are really overweight, and I do send them to our weight loss management programs to try to help with that. It does play a big role. Uh, so I'll just comment that I think it's challenging if you have someone with deep venous reflux and lymphedema, um, just like Dr. Carmen saying. And I think the looking for outflow is challenging, even more challenging, of a question or something to go after because we know that for edema, venous stenting has the least improvement, right? It's 50-50. I mean, we don't get good results for just edema. So I think it's, it's again, a challenging problem and with not a straightforward solution, so I'd, I'd tread that quite lightly. You know, I think edema is also different than true you know, venous disease. We see a lot of edema. That's a whole nother talk. It's a whole, you know, series of talks, but there's so much that contributes to swelling in many of our patients um, that you really have to sort out what the edema is, then talk about the disease. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Next, uh, my colleague from the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute, Karen Harth, is going to come talk to us about when should I consider endovenous ablation and which approach? Hello. I was just going to make a suggestion. Can I just say one thing? I'm sorry, Karen. Uh, this is a new format uh, that we designed this year to try to make it more interactive with everyone. As you can see, we have a little bit of a problem because our panelists are not able to see the monitor. So if you guys are uncomfortable, you may want to come down and, you know, we just want to make this interactive and make sure everybody's enjoying and we are learning. So I don't want you guys to get neck spasm by the morning and, and, uh, or afternoon. And same thing with you guys, Dr. Carmen. And, you know, if you guys just, you want to, if it's, you can see it, okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. The torticollis is going to get better now. Okay. So, um, well, thank you so much. So I'm going to try and stay on time here. So I'm going to be speaking about when should I consider uh, endovenous ablation and which approach. Certainly there are lots of different approaches, and so we'll go over some of those. These are my disclosures. So the first one, so we'll get right to it with a case presentation. Um, this patient is a 50-year-old female G4P3, so significant multi Paris woman with pain, edema, pruritus, and C4C disease, which is the coronaphlebectatica, with symptoms uh, at that area as well. She's actually fairly good about compliance. She's been dealing with this for many years and finally presents for an evaluation. Uh, pertinent history includes she did have an episode of phlebitis, which was managed with NSAIDs during one of her pregnancies and had a total abdominal hysterectomy about a year prior to this presentation. So what are our next steps? So I, one thing that I want to prompt the audience to is to look at the um, image, as that's obviously the exam. The exam should always be done upright. The patient standing gives you a better sense of what their venous disease pattern may look like. And I gave a little magna uh, picture there of what coronaphlebectatica looks like, particularly on the medial malleolus on the contralateral leg, but she had the same thing on the ipsilateral leg, which we're looking at now, which is on the right side. So some thoughts from folks in the audience, maybe? Folks who do venous procedures, let's just raise a hand. How many folks do superficial venous disease in their practice? Okay, great. So there should be lots of ideas. Reflux study. Sorry? Reflux study. Reflux study. Okay, good. Does the pattern or her exam give you a sense of what you may find? No. What do you think? Okay. All right, good. So um, importantly, though, there's a lot of very superficial varicosities at the uh, uh, skin level, so we got a lot of tributaries to, to take into account. So here's her VI study, and we could see that um, the vein is patent, there's no evidence of phlebitis, there's no chronic changes there. Um, her diameter is pretty dilated at the saphenofemoral junction at 11 millimeters. Reflux time is very significant all the way down to about the calf. 
There's an area in the knee which was measured pretty small, 1.7 millimeters. Um, and so when you look at these venous insufficiency studies, I think that what's important is what are we calling the GSV. Sometimes the GSV is called the GSV when it comes out of the fascia. It's important to know if there's an atretic or residual segment in the fascia with this um, extra fascial component, which is really a um, tributary. And that really should guide the kinds of therapies you use because different things are indicated in different anatomic locations. So treatment-wise, what are the options here? I don't want to pick on the same volunteer back there. Anybody else? I saw a lot of hands. Yeah, panelists. Let's pick on the panelists. Please. Yeah, you got the right here. So I thought you were asking everybody else. So. I did not see anything about the deep system, though. Deep system was fine. Good question. No reflex. I would uh, personally uh, consider RF ablation versus uh, venous seal, the only <clears throat> or, or laser ablation. The only problem with venous seal is the knee uh, is less than two millimeter, and a lot of times you have issues getting the catheter across that part. And definitely, you have to talk about allergies. Do they have allergies to adhesive or tape? But I would maybe favor RF or laser ablation in this lady. One, one thing I would uh, do in this person uh, is probably do two level ablations, which I've done before. Go from below knee to all the way up to that uh, area where it becomes more superficial and tiny, and then go above and access a second segment and go up to the rest of the ablation if you really don't want to do a venous seal. And how, I'm sorry, the bottom you would address how? From, the from just the GSV going all the way up to the knee where it becomes a tiny segment towards the skin. So we complete ablation in that area, close all the perforators, and then go above the knee, access another segment, and do a second ablation for the same GSV. So two, ther one non-thermal, one thermal? I'm talking both uh, venous seals, but getting two axes, seal, above two knee axis. and below knee, yeah. Okay. So I will kind of uh, direct you to the fact that it's hard to see in this picture, but right on the thigh, I mean, the, it basically has this large bulky uh, varicosity which runs along the whole uh, dermal skin uh, down all the way to the calf. Um, so my approach is kind of a two, two uh, sort of approach. I use both thermal and non-thermal here. And anatomically, and, and we'll talk about this with all the other cases, but anatomy dictates therapy. Just remember that. It will, you'll get, um, and you should use the toolbox of a therapy. So her GSV essentially became extra fascial at the upper thigh. There was no atretic or small segment. All of those measurements or actually of the dermal component. So that really is very important. So you look at the patient and then you look at the scan. You gotta look at the scan, not just the reports. Um, because all from the butterfly needle up was the measurements that were provided in the report with the reflexing segment. Um, and so my approach was thermal for the fascial component up to the saphenofermal junction, and then non-thermal with foam sclerotherapy from the knee up, and that gives a good result. The best result is always in these patients, at least in my practice, is you gotta follow them up within a week or two for microthermectomy to relieve the phlebitis in that superficial segment to get a good um, symptom result and cosmetic result as well. So Dr. Harb, just for the sake of challenges, why not surgery? Yeah, so that's good. So certainly another approach would be combined ablation or uh, with a phlebectomy of the, the, the distal part. So the best results really in large veins to remove the veins, not to inject them, because especially with very superficial veins like that, whether you inject or laser or radiofrequency, the patients will feel them. Now we have many patients, it takes a long time for them to disappear. So perhaps a combination, including surgery for the larger ones, might be the best result. Completely agree. I think when, in my practice, I tend to offer the phlebectomy for the younger patients and less so for the older because of the surgical risk. Um, I, some of these can be done in an ambulatory setting. So that's certainly an important consideration is what's your practice pattern and what do you have available. Um, a lot of these decisions are also made uh, with the patient. So it's patient expectation, physician expectation, and some of them want to do it all office based. So we talk about the expectations. So if we want to do it all office based, that's fine. There will be a sense of phlebitis. There will be a sense of pain. We can drain it, and you have to come back for the drainage to get a good result. And actually, um, you know, to a, to a decent range of about three to four millimeters, I mean, you can still get a very good result over time. It may just take like nine to 12 months. So they just have to understand that. So another case, oh, did I go over? 
Okay, one minute. I'm gonna go over this one real quick. So this is a 60-year-old male with one episode of phlebitis in a setting of very bulky varicosities. He had lipodermatosclerotic changes with a C4 disease at the ankle, and you could see here this very large varicosity, and it's hard to tell where the GSV is because he had all these tributaries coming out right near the saphenofemoral junction. So my approach to this was anticoagulation. Um, I treated him for a couple of months, allowed this inflammation and the thrombus to resolve. You could see here what his picture looks like. Um, he had a venous insufficiency study, which tried uh, in the beginning to look for the reflux at the GSV segment, which is where his disease uh, process started. Uh, eventually, we offered him RFA with phlebectomy. We had enough of a GSV stump to the saphenofemoral junction to do concomitant phlebectomy, uh, RFA with phlebectomy, and these are really bulky veins. So I removed all of these, and this is post-procedural uh, leg on the far right. He did develop a little bit of a knee hit, which I treated just for a short period, and then he does well. A non-thermal approach, uh, so at the top, again, what the anatomy helps decide therapy. We had a patient with LDS. I could go all the way from the ankle to the groin, and this is a non-thermal approach, so I was able to ablate the whole source of the axial disease in the setting of LDS. Bottom is a patient with small saphenous disease who had an ulcer in the lateral foot, used a non-thermal approach. He actually had a vein of Giacomini, so you gotta follow that SSV all the way up. Every time I do these cases, you gotta prep to the gluteal fold so that we can address the entire segment of disease. And this was done, again, with non-thermal approach. And these are some of the cases where you might consider combined therapy where you have RFA and phlebectomy. And again, a lot of these decisions are also made in conjunction with the patient, so they know the expectation and you give them the result they desire. Um, so lots of presentations, appropriateness of use, use the therapies appropriately. They're indicated for certain segments, anatomic segments. And the anatomy is very variable. You always have to look. You always have to rescan on the day of the procedure and be prepared to do um, the right therapy. So thorough history and clinical exam provides early anatomic clues and the anticipated therapy options. Venous insufficiency study is critical to choosing the correct therapy. Make sure these studies are done in reverse Trendelenburg or in standing position. And you always want to consider the symptoms. You want to trace the source to where the problem is. See, uh, chronic venous insufficiency that does, does not come in one flavor, nor do the therapies. And so key learning points are understanding the patient's needs and setting expectations. The severity of disease should be treated, traced back to the anatomy, and you should use the right therapy for that anatomy. It's important to build on your venous toolbox to accommodate the variability across the spectrum of venous disease. Thank you so much. All right, next we're going to invite uh, another one of my colleagues from the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. Jane Chung is going to come and present a case of a venous ulcer and tell us what was available. All right, uh, thank you. Um, I am a graduating vascular surgery fellow at uh, UH Case Western. We'll be staying on as faculty, presenting a case uh, done by our phenom vein surgeon, Dr. Harth. I have no financial disclosures. So we're going to start off with a 63-year-old female. Um, she has a very prolonged venous disease history, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, but at the time that she's seen us, she's had this non-healing right uh, leg wound for about 13 years. She did have a previous biopsy that ruled out any malignancy, anything um, funny from, from the wound. Um, and her pertinent history does include um, some common comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, hypothyroidism. These were all controlled on medications. She is blind. And uh, as noted, she does have a history of bilateral common iliac vein stents that were placed about three years prior to her first visit with us. So uh, another provider uh, she had seen um, when she initially had bilateral lower extremity ulcers. And this provider uh, uh, took her for a diagnostic venogram, did an IVIS, and really interrogated her veins and found two different segments of her uh, common iliac veins bilaterally that were very compressed. So he elected to put in stents in these, uh, in these veins. Um, and then had some follow-up with her, but she was sort of lost uh, shortly after that. Um, some of the clinic notes did show that she had some improvement in her right leg swelling, uh, greater than her left, and the plans were for continued wound care. Um, but she, again, stopped kind of coming to these clinics as well, didn't think they were very helpful, couldn't really tolerate the compression stockings due to pain, 
Um, and again, she's blind, and so it, it was hard for her to kind of care for these. Um, she was doing dressing changes with alginate and curlex at the time that we had seen her. And after her initial clinic visit, we placed her in a an unaboot and um, kind of went over some of her history. Uh, this is just showing where the venous stents were placed. Uh, the left was a little bit more proximal. Uh, he was concerned for a more May Thurner type, um, type picture here. And on the right, it's a little bit more distal, but both in the common. And then the pictures. So you can see she has a very large ulcerated lesion on her right foot. Um, this was very bothersome for her, very painful. And so the clinical challenge here is um, she was already seen by another provider, had somewhat of a venous workup done. What are things we need to rule out? What testing would you like to see? And um, what more do you want to obtain in order to guide her further treatment? Questions, yeah, from our panelists or the audience? So it looks like inflammatory area in addition to the venous ulcer. Did you rule out any vasculitis, inflammatory changes? Uh, there was a sort of inflammatory picture of it. Um, there was, her white count was normal. There was no concern that it was any sort of cellulitis picture. Uh, the, again, the biopsy didn't show any sort of vasculitis or, or microvascular changes. But yes, great thought, especially for someone with such prolonged disease. So this is the need for compression, 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 and sleeping in a bed with the foot of the bed elevated, because she's probably also sleeping in the chair. Many of my patients who are blind, they have that non-24-7 type of thing, and they, they, their days and nights are mixed up, so they spend their days chronically dependent. And you can do all you'd like for this edema. You're not going to overcome gravity. So in my practice, really, what I will do, I'll take the patient, if everything was done for the SSFB, the greater saphenous vein, no other disease, I will inject every vein in the base of this ulcer and around it, whether it's refluxing or not, as long as superficial. We have a 94% healing rate with this approach. Excellent. That's excellent. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we kind of did some review of her imaging and what other stuff she had done. And her uh, physical exam, as well as her arterial perfusion, was no normal. Um, she had a CT venogram showing that the stents were non-fractured, non-migrant. They were patent. But we under she underwent a diagnostic venogram as well, confirming that. And she's got robust flow through her venous system. The stents are all patent. So there was no issue with the deep venous uh, work that had been done prior. But you hit the nail on the head. No one had actually really looked at her superficial venous system before. And so she underwent a VI study showing significant reflux at the GSV at the proximal calf, as well as her uh, SSV. So uh, to resolve this sort of case, uh, we had to rule out some important things, an arterial component to it, inflammatory vasculitis component to it, malignancy. Once that was out of the picture, then we eliminated issues with the stents that were placed before or any problems with the deep venous system, underwent a venography with IVIS as well as uh, with the CTV. And then finally, uh, it leaves the superficial venous system to be treated. Um, she ultimately underwent a uh, rate of frequency ablation of the SSV, uh, followed by stage procedures of varathene injections of perforators of the GSV at the ulcer location. And you can see she's healed up quite nicely from that. This is after, I think, uh, the third treatment of her varathena. And here you can sort of see the progression from starting uh, when she first came to us to, to how she is now. So really key learning things for this case is um, everyone's very eager to, to treat the deep venous system. But remember uh, what Dr. Harth was saying, it's all about anatomy and it's all about knowing that there's two systems here too. And don't forget about the superficial component to things. Um, and then also some of the patients are going to have uh, complex social situations. They're going to have comorbidities that make it very difficult for them uh, to take care of these things. And continuity of care and um, adequate wound care and regular wound care are very critical for these, for these patients. Great. Right. Um, questions from the panelists or no, the I think, um, I think I, I totally agree, you know, don't forget about the superficial system. Um, my approach is unless there is a critical, deep, 
iliac vein stenosis, I would approach the superficial system first, especially with questions about long-term patency of our uh, deep iliac vein stents. Uh, now, another thing I immediately like to point out as a cardiologist, I would not always forget about uh, central heart failure, mm -hmm. RV failure, pulmonary hypertension, mm -hmm. especially when you inject the common femoral and you see deeper reflux into the internal iliac veins, you suspect there's something more central going on. Yes, that's a great point. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Excellent. All right, we're going to move on to Dr. Huff, who's here from our neighboring hospital, Ohio Health. And he'll be talking about technical aspects of chronic venous intervention, what I should know, have known when I started. Can we bring up the next talk? All right, any questions? <laughs> so, so while we're bringing up the, the next talk, Karim, I'm assuming on that last case, you also put the patient in some form of compression, Unibu, it's got home health care involved, something to, to really help with this. Oh, I, don't, I don't think ablating those two small segments was all of the answer for this. So she had actually been getting wound care at home. Um, she was getting home care. Well, and but, mm -hmm. but an alginate twice a day. She's not going to get the job. No, no, no. So, I, yeah, I think, um, I don't really know the, can't remember offhand the specifics, but she was getting home care, and then we actually additionally did refer her to a formal wound center. So, yeah, this doesn't happen in isolation with intervention, but... I could tell you that um, she had zero progress after just deep venous denting. And for 10 years, she really kind of got lost out there and you know, she had other challenges. So um, once we kind of did more of a multimodal approach, we really got a good result. Excellent. All right, looks like they have the presentation ready. Um, we're gonna change gears a little bit and talk about deep venous disease. Um, I have eight minutes to give you 10 years worth of pearls, so we're going to kind of grind through this pretty quickly. It's not working. There we go. I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. I think starting out, when you begin treating chronic deep venous disease, you need to be very careful about case selection. If you want to be successful, you need to choose the right cases. And the right cases are the guns that have good venous inflow, infrainguinal inflow. If you're going to place stents in the IVC and iliac veins, you need those stents to stay patent. Patency will depend on flow from below. Now, in an ideal world, the common femoral vein would be free of disease. And when you have to extend your stents across the inguinal ligament, it would land in a very nice, healthy spot. That's not always the case. Sometimes you're stuck landing it in the healthiest spot, okay? But it's important that you have good inflow from your common fem, profunda, and femoral to have the best chance at long-term patency. Again, that's ideal. It doesn't always work out that way. So how do we determine if someone has good venous inflow? Well, we determine that with pre-procedure imaging. Very important is axial imaging with CT venogram. But a CT venogram can really overestimate the health of your common femoral veins. So it's very important you have an updated venous duplex. I say updated because a lot of patients present within a six-month-old, eight-month-old venous duplex. You get a CT, you decide to proceed with intervention, and you're surprised by the amount of disease in the inflow vessels when you get into the case. If there's any question regarding inflow, then it's very wise to proceed with an angiography before committing to complex reconstruction. This is a gentleman I saw recently, 450 pounds, chronic venous disease. There was a lots of questions regarding his inflow on his axial and duplex imaging, so we brought him in for angiography. You can see his common femoral vein is diffusely diseased. 
There's no place to land a stent. His profunda vein is occluded. We elected not to proceed with intervention here. You may have somewhat success on the table, but I can assure you these tents will not stay open. This is a case you want to, you run, you want to run away from. So one thing I've learned over the years is it's very important to do these cases under general anesthesia. Our surgical colleagues know this. Now I'm an interventional cardiologist. We tend to do things with moderate sedation. This is not a case you want to do with moderate sedation. It's a long procedure, and it's extremely painful for the patient. If the patient's having pain, then you're having anxiety, and you tend to undersize your balloons and stents, and you end up with an inadequate outcome. Put these patients to sleep. In really complex patients, I like to have an extra doc there, sometimes an extra tech, because you may find yourself working from above and below and trying to meet in the middle to recanalize the occluded IVC. I know we all don't have the luxury to have two teams working at the same time, but it actually goes much faster. You're gonna to wanna to prep the neck, you wanna to wanna to prep both legs, groin and knees, because you're gonna need multiple access sites. You're always gonna to wanna to access at the lesser troke or below, because that will give you plenty of running room to put your sheath in and begin your wiring. And you're gonna need access to the whole common femoral vein, because you very commonly will need to extend your stent all the way to the takeoff, or sorry, the insertion of the profunda. And then once you have access and you're in, take angiogram in multiple views, find the appropriate route for wiring. It may be a little confusing. Venous disease is way more complex than arterial. So this is just a snapshot of where you should access. If you get access and you step on fluoro and that needle is above the lesser troke, re-access. Otherwise, it's gonna be a pain for you later on. Get as low as you can. So now you're in, how do you cross? Well, as with most interventions, it's all about support. So I like to start with eight French sheaths and shove them all the way to the start of the occlusion. And then through there, I'll tend to work my way through with 035 support catheters, Navicross catheter works well here, CXI. I tend to use the gamut of glide wires. The straight glide is particularly helpful. In patients who I have difficulty crossing, this system by Cook, the Triforce catheter is very helpful. It's a four French sheath with a CXI catheter inside, and you can use it to navigate through this chronic occlusion. It actually provides a lot of support, it's very helpful. And you will often have to wire, particularly in IVC occlusions, from above and below to get through these. Don't be afraid to use CTO wires. Don't be afraid to use reentry catheters like Pioneer. Just make sure you know what is IVC and what is aorta. Don't be this guy. So there are so many collaterals running through the pelvis. When you cross, you need to make sure you have taken the appropriate route through what's supposed to be the iliac system. There are a lot of paraspinal collaterals, and you can easily end up in those. So how do you determine? It's hard to see here, but the spine's on the right, the wire's on the left. This is a lateral projection after crossing. If your wire is anterior to the spine in a lateral projection, you are not in a spinal collateral, okay? And then always IVUS before treating. This isn't an iliac, it's ephemeral, but it makes the point. If you look at the picture on the left, the wire looks like it crossed, crossed straight through the femoral vein up to the common femoral. But Ivis showed that it actually veered off into that parallel small collateral to the left. Luckily, this was recognized by Ivis prior to treatment, and the wire was repositioned. You can see by Ivis, this is after the wire was been repositioned, and the initial wiring was actually in that small collateral. So it would have caused a lot of trouble advancing equipment, may have even hurt the patient if you didn't recognize that before proceeding. So now that you know your wire's in a good place, you can be very aggressive with ballooning and stenting. This is why general anesthesia is so important. It hurts the patient a lot, okay? And with them asleep, you can be aggressive and you can get that iliac to the size it's supposed to be. I typically balloon the iliacs with 12 to 14 millimeter balloons and the IVC with 20 millimeter balloons. You're gonna wanna balloon the IVC from both access sites, break up all the webs that are there. It's gonna give you a better result when you go to stent. You can stent the IVC a lot of different ways. Uh, you can do kissing stents below the renals down. You can do a body and limb approach, kind of like an endograft. Both give great results. They have equal patency. Just do whatever you're more comfortable with. Importantly, you're not gonna be able to size your stents based on the CT scan, okay, or based on IVIS. These vessels are severely diseased and shriveled. You're gonna to wanna to size your stents based on vessel size norms or based on the patient's contralateral leg. If there's no common femoral landing zone, 
and you must get the case done. Do not gel the profunda and go into the femoral vein. It is much better to extend into the profunda. The profunda is super important as it is in arterial disease. So this is just a picture of kissing stents from the renal veins down. You can see it, it leads to a very adequate result. And this is a body limb approach. Again, equally good result, patency is equal. So what's your post-procedure anticoagulation strategy? I usually do clopidogrel for three months. I like low molecular weight heparin for two weeks while things calm down and then transition to orals. I prefer DOAC unless they have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or they can't afford DOAC, then we can treat with warfarin. Surveillance, I like duplex at 1, 3, 6, and 12 months. If there's any question about resinosis, CT venogram or angiography. After 12 months, I usually repeat yearly or based on symptoms. So in conclusion, venous inflow is the most important predictor of long-term patency. Use general anesthesia. It'll be good for you and the patient. Always IVUS before treating. Be aggressive with your PTA and stenting. Plavix for three months, indefinite anticoagulation, and survey these stents closely. Thanks. Excellent case, excellent uh, tips and tricks. Those are certainly uh, good things to remember as it takes a while to get there. So um, questions from the audience or other panelists? Yes, I see one there. You know, the one thing uh, that I would uh, qu quabble with, squabble with just a little bit is the general anesthesia issue. Uh, and uh, I have generally preferred to do these with somebody awake because of the feedback and fear of perforation. And I will say that's kind of the way I was trained. And I have taken the approach that sometimes you take a four millimeter balloon, they have pain. And you wait a few minutes, and then a 6, and then an 8, and then a 10, and then a 12, and eventually you get up to the size you're talking about, but it's been a kind of a slow uh, advance. And I've always been fearful that when a patient with a balloon says, ow, that I should stop whatever I'm doing and run the other way because I have perforated. Then on the other hand, I, I, I appreciate your experience in that you're not likely to have a catastrophic bleed with a vessel that's sort of fibrotic and whatnot. Yeah, this so, is different than arterial disease. Yeah. Obviously, I don't perform iliac artery intervention under general anesthesia because when they say, ow, I back off. You know, you're asking for a bad problem. Venous disease is much different. Catastrophic perforation is rare. I don't want to say it's zero, but it's rare. And, you know, if you treat enough of these, they always hurt. And then it's more sedation, more sedation, then basically you have them comatose on the table trying to get them to tolerate a 14 millimeter balloon. So when it's really fibrotic and really scarred, it's just better to have them asleep because would, what you'll end up doing is undersizing your stents. Would you say the same is true for the SVC and for upper extremity veins? No, I wouldn't. The SVC scares me a lot okay. because it can lead to tamponade, um, yeah. and I've been there. Um, but you're again, the complications resulting from uh, iliac vein perforation can be dealt with very quickly. Um, yeah. You know, it's also important to have a conversation with your anesthesiologist. You know, tell me if you're titrating meds. Tell me if something has changed hemodynamically. But I just think it's, it's better for the patient if they're asleep for this. Great. Just one quick more question, and we have to move on to our next speaker. I'll, I'll run around. There are two microphones in the room, so please use our services. Mehdi and I are very fleet-footed. So, and also take, in, take your seats if you want to come down to the front. There are a lot of empty seats. Don't be shy and fill up your coffee and do come around. All right. Yes, right here. So we'll, uh, any questions or, can, or were you going to give it to someone? So a very quick uh, thing on uh, venous. I do it under local, I don't do it under general, unless it is TIPS or the whole IVC is occluded, then go to general. The um, issue of the flow, which many people are talking about, you cannot really take it in a patient who has diseased veins. So outflow occlusion will decrease the flow distally, and thrombosis distally will decrease flow, so you cannot depend on that. We always forget about the third option when the common femoral, femoral profunda are diseased. Clean them surgically, and you will get much better result. Like endarterectomy for the carotid, you do it for the vein, and you do the distal iliac also, 
and put your stents after that in a very healthy vein, it's much easier to clean than actually cleaning the carotid for aortic surgery, which we call phlebo-endophlebectomy, which is much easier for people who are doing it. I think poor outflow is usually due to operator error and poor stent placement. Inflow you can't control, but you can control who you put a lot of stent in. So, Excellent points. Um, we will move on to our next speaker. So <clears throat> we have Mahesh Ananta uh, Narayanan. He is going to be speaking to us about May Therner, when, why, and how to treat. I hope I pronounced your name right. You, you did perfectly Welcome. right. Thank you. From Arkansas. While we, while we wait, oh, I was going to say one quick thing. Question. Can I ask a question? Presentation, Chris. I think that your point about the anesthesia, I think the, maybe to emphasize is that you use a lot of IVUS and you are sure that you are in the right place, going back to your example of the femoral vein. So, yes, you want to use general anesthesia. It's a different, different area of the body and you can be more aggressive, but you got to make sure that you're in the right place. Is that correct? It's accurate. And straightforward May Therners, you don't have to put those patients to sleep. But when we're talking about very chronic, terrible cavoiliac obstruction, it's a long case and it's painful. All right, the, uh, the, I'm Dr. Mahesh Ananta. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists uh, practicing in Arkansas. And uh, the previous speaker has made my topic really easy, so I'm just going to go quickly through the slides I'm thinking. So my topic, assigned topic is an iliac venous compression syndrome, particularly May Therner. When, why, and how to treat this? I have no relevant disclosures for this presentation. So our patient, I just want to show you a pretty straightforward case and then show you some alternate uh, uh, cases, not straightforward ones. This is a 46-year-old female presented with left lower extremity pain, typical middle-aged female uh, with left lower extremity swelling. Uh, pertinent history, she is extremely um, obese and uh, she is hypertensive. So imaging and diagnostic studies, she got a venous duplex that showed extensive DVT in the common femoral as well as the deep femoral veins, and she has had prior venous ablations to both extremities in the past. And that's something to stop and talk about for a second. Um, I see a lot of these patients presenting with venous reflex, and obviously uh, when we miss iliac compression and ablate these veins and they get a DVT, there is no passage for blood to go around, and they develop, develop more symptoms, so it's very essential to make sure that we're not missing any major outflow in these people, uh, any really iliac venous problems before we go ahead and take care of the superficial veins. So the clinical challenge in this case, patient was treated with um, anticoagulation, but DVD persisted after uh, uh, six months of therapy, and she had repeat ultrasound that showed persistent left lower extremity thrombus, and she was planned for a left lower extremity angiogram with me. And then we... Uh, Actually went from up and over uh, from right groin. She has extensive thrombus on the left side. We went to the fresh uh, 16 penumbra catheter, aspirated a lot of thrombus, extending all the way up to the femoral, deep femoral, and then we performed uh, uh, IBIS on this. Just to illustrate what May Therner is, there is a lot of variance to May Therner syndrome, but the most common picture is, is a fight between the left common iliac vein and the right common iliac artery. It's basically compression of left common iliac vein. There are variations where internal artery can compress your external iliac vein, and you can have the same finding on the right side, depending on anatomical locations, but the most common presentation is on the left side. This is a 3D reconstruction done at our institution. One of the patients that we had, it just shows an anatomical relation with the vein, the artery is just going across and compressing the vein. But to prove maternus, you do have to have a dynamic study, and you do have to prove diameter with IVUS um, to, to show compression. So we, this is the second time we bring her after aspirating thrombus from the left side, after confirming, uh, uh, and then with a CT scan, and then we are getting left groin axis here, um, and then we have a wire across here, and then you can see right at that spot, it's usually right at the confluence, right at the bifurcation. Um, it almost feels like it always extends into the IVC from most of the cases. And this is our pre-procedure like this. It's gonna run for a second, but we are just coming down from IVC all the way down below, trying to document compression. I don't know if there's a way to scroll through the middle of the video. You can just show. Um, but the artery is in close relation to the vein, and you want to prove that this is the common iliac. Compressing your uh, vein right there, we are coming from the IVC, and pretty significant compression at that spot right there. So when we talk about 
how we size stands, that's more important. My previous speaker made it really easy for us, but this is usually how I go. Just go length, breadth, and just take the average and add two, uh, two centimeter, two, two millimeter to it. And this is how we stand it. We used a wall stand. We went all the way from the IVC to come down below. And I've had a, a few discussions where people worried about standing all the way into the ostium or doing bilateral kissing iliac stents. From um, what I have seen, the patency rates are pretty similar for both, and I prefer to cover the ostium rather than not covering the ostium. It's not like coronary bifurcation where you try to nail ostium sometimes. You can never get that taken care of. And believe me, even after you stent like this, the right IVC has enough space, uh, the right iliac has enough space to drain into IVC, even if you want to do something in the future, a right art cath or anything, you should still be able to approach through that. As you can see in this picture, this is after stenting with um, IVC space stenting. You can see the space around the and the vessel in this IVC. The IVC is still big and compliant. It can expand. So you don't really have to uh, worry about compressing the IVC with a stent. So look for other causes. I'm going to show you three other cases. Uh, one of them is a right side uh, problem that came in. And this is what we found. She had a lot of thrombus right down there. And then we came from left up and over, aspirated with penumbra. But you can see right in the middle of the iliac vein, where the junction of common iliac, external iliac, she has this compression. And this is right after we fixed it. And then we got to retrospectively do a, a CT venogram, and you can see this. Or sorry, um, a CT venogram. You can see this is stent, and there is a mass that's encaseating the vein and compressing the vein, actually. So it is a tumor that she had a local leomyoma of uterus sometime and went and compressed the vein and caused uh, iliac occlusion. It was a little bit lower than usual. Another presentation, um, and lady on the left side, if you see the picture, you'll see a compression, a pretty bad compression from there, and it's almost occluding this, a string sign, and there's no flow at all in that. And this is after we ballooned it open from the popliteal axis. And we couldn't really pass a wire above, so we had to come up and over. And we snared the wire from above just to get through the occlusion. And finally, just established some flow. But you can see how it behaves right after ballooning. And then we ended up standing across. We did have to come lower down because the occlusion extended all the way down below. But also, this lady happened to have a primary tumor in the lung. This is a pattern for me. I've been seeing more and more of these cases. You see the big mass that's compressing the right side. and that's a secondary mats from lungs that's coming down and compressing. Another atypical presentation in a pretty young, healthy guy who had clots in the past, treated for six months, no improvement, but that compression is distal, um, almost common from all this lexal iliac, um, and it's post-thrombotic syndrome with no masses identified. So it's really important to investigate what kind of uh, problem we have before we go in and fix them. Just quickly going over the types of stents, I don't know if the room has any preference, with stents, I prefer the wall stent as well as um, the average stents, Metronic stents. Um, and you can see the difference in all of them is every, most of the stents we use these days are open start design, and, and a couple of them are closed stent, which is um, a Venovo as well as Vichy stents are a closed start design here. Problem with using closed stent design is basically you do have limited blood flow, less chance of endothelization because they are pretty rigid and stiff, and risk of stent migration and limited uh, flexibility with these stents. So basically, just the take-home points here, you diagnose these conditions on a dynamic obstruction of flow greater than 50% reduction in diameter of vein with or without a collateral. Just to know the usual size of your veins are going to be 14 to 16 for common iliac vein. And you do have to use high-pressure balloon. You don't really want to post early the stents because they can always uh, foreshort. They, they can short, and then you have to add another stent, which increases the risk of thrombus in the future. That's the mathematics I usually use to go uh, to calculate the size of a stent. And then use two stents if you're using it, uh, then overlap at least by two centimeter. And you have to establish good flow, comparable flow, at least 20% or less compared to the contralateral vein if you achieve normalcy. So anyway, diagnosis is the key for this. Anticoagulation for acute DVT is, is really important. And endovascular intervention involving taking the thrombus load out plus also fixing the problem. And routine follow-up, as my previous speaker mentioned, to just uh, have surveillance one, three, six, and one-year uh, follow-up with these patients are essential. With this, I thank CVA for the opportunity, and I'm open to take questions here. OK, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. We have one more talk, and then we'll have uh, time for some questions. So we'll move on to Dr. Manaj uh, Tangam from uh, Ascension in Texas. He's going to be speaking about acute DVT post attract patient selection and approach. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Manoj. That was loud. Uh, so we'll start off with some DBT work here. Okay. Good. Let us know when you are ready to move, guys, to the back. Good? Good. I think the top blue, the top green button. Yeah. The top oh, green sorry. button. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. So no disclosures. And then going over here, I want to start off attract. What did it tell us since the title of the talk is going to be acute DVT after attract? Turns out doing something doesn't necessarily cause some massive benefit in the focus of post thrombotic syndrome. And I think that's important for all of us to recognize in the space when we're going after things. What is the data actually showing us for what we can benefit? This is a randomized controlled trial split into two pretty even cohorts. Uh, one of the caveats of the trials to kind of look down there, and you see 692 patients uh, that were enrolled, but out of that specifically, what you can see is the a number of patients that got categorized into the actual iliac and common femoral wasn't exactly all of the patients. So it came out to right underneath 60 patients, which is 60% of the patients, which you can see down over there. So despite the fact that without a doubt you would expect an increased risk of bleed if you're going in with a thrombolytic system, and then on top of it a procedural access, you're going to have a bit more bleed in the first 10 days, you didn't have any unique benefit on long-term post-thrombotic syndrome, which was the focus of this trial. So they looked at it again two years later and asked the question, if you looked at specific patients and asked in common iliac and, or any iliac in common femoral, is there a difference? Once again, no, it's not a difference in post-thrombotic syndrome, but it did make a difference in quality of life. It made a difference in the severity of post-thrombotic syndrome when it did occur, and it made a difference in the first kind of initial response to the DVT and how patients felt with that. Why is that important? Because not being able to stand on your leg, not being able to do the basic things that make you feel like you're human is not great. And that's really the focus of what I want the talk to be. We're doing this for symptoms, we're doing this for quality of life, and we're doing this in the patients. Therefore, the focus of everything ought to be that, the patient. So starting off, uh, the workhorses for what we tend to use in our center are going to be the clot retriever device as well as the penumbra device. The systems in terms of platform are pretty similar in terms of French size. You're talking about a 13 versus 12 French size, and they each have kind of some unique advantages and some disadvantages, with the obvious being if you're sucking blood out of the patient and you can't give it back, you should be mindful of the fact that they're anemic. The other options here is um, one of our bailouts tends to be ECOS. It's probably similar in other centers throughout the country as well. If we can't get clot debulked, we have a ton of clot that's residual, we have to do something, and we have to help them in some format, so it tends to be a thrombolysis option there uh, with ECOS. Another kind of up-and-coming system that we will have on, on our options and on our shelves in the future is going to be the Wolf system that works a little bit different, kind of works as a huge caterpillar that engulfs the clot and gets it out of the body in a semi-desiccated manner, so it'll be interesting to see, see how that works when it's that. So the first case I wanted to talk about is a 59-year-old. Um, came in, shortness of breath, lower extremity swelling, uh, pain at rest, and can't bear any weight on the leg. So severely symptomatic. Now, to com combine you know, the complexity, it's a patient with poor prognosis. Has glioblastoma multiforme, which is obviously not a positive sign for the long-term prognosis. Ended up having a craniotomy about a month ago, and then comes in now um, with a low-risk PE, quantified um, with a low PESI score as well, and a hugely symptomatic DVT. Look at the ultrasound, which in our center we depend very heavily on ultrasounds. The limitations to that, to be mindful, is that you can't see too much in the proximal areas. So iliacs are very hard to visualize often, especially because the patient have this, and we're in Texas. So Texas size makes it difficult, as you could imagine. Um, on top of that, you have something here that's a common femoral confirmed with absolutely no flow. So what do you do? I mean, the real question just comes down to do you treat or do you not treat? And I think uh, I'm happy to have any input from others, but for the sake of kind of moving through cases, we chose to treat. Obviously, I'm presenting it here at CVI, so that's the reason that you could expect the answer. But the thought process behind why we treat is because literally the patient could not put any weight on the leg, could not move, was having severe pain, even at rest, and when they're moved in bedside, they were screaming. So we chose to use the clot retriever here. We thought it was a fairly new clot. In our center, we make it a kind of a simple platform to go through things kind of exactly the same every time so we don't make too many errors. And we shoot the, the kind of junction here going into the IBC. Main reason for that, I want to know if there's a lot of clot in the IBC. I want to know if I'm going to shoot clot down the other side, occlude other things, or if the clot extends a lot further than what my ultrasound showed me. It took us three passes. And we got a pretty good result um, out of it. We got good flow there. And these are the chunks, uh, uh, chunks of pieces of, of clot that we got out of the body, which was useful. The thing that I'm going to highlight again and again in the talk is that these pieces of clot look really great on pictures. Um, 
Cardio Twitter loves them, and that's all wonderful and great, but that's not the point of the case. That's not the point of what we need to do for the patients. The point comes down to inline flow, and I think that's what we're gonna iterate, especially in our last case. Our second case here is a 79-year-old, comes in, shortens of breath, lower extremity swelling, um, and ends up having bilateral PE with RV strain with a higher PESI score. We evaluated him through a multidisciplinary approach. Through our PERC team, we developed the idea to say we should do ECOs for this patient. He also had ultrasounds because we make sure all of our PEs end up getting their legs checked out, and then that ultrasound just showed us occlusive thrombus going at least through the common femoral. So in his, um, and this is that ultrasound, in that index, I went ahead and shot coming down from the neck to see how extensive the clot was. That's as far as I can get into the iliac coming in from above. And then what I could see is that it's pretty extensive going into the very kind of iliac and common femoral region, and there's no kind of ability to get past that. Also, I confirmed that there's no clot sitting in the, in the junction of the IVC. So I think the, the real question here, once again, would you treat, would you not treat? And for the same reasons as above, which is that we have a completely occlusive thrombus, we have a very symptomatic patient, and not for the focus of trying to decrease post-thrombotic syndrome, which we know by clinical trial data that we can't, we went ahead and did. And this one we chose for number. He had plenty of hemoglobin, and we wanted to see kind of what we could accomplish here. Um, and by the way, the clot retriever, the penumbra, these platforms, and most of acute DVTs are done from popliteal access, so they're going to be laying on their belly. You're going to go in behind their knee, uh, make sure you have a nice little access there confirmed by ultrasound access, as well as with, um, with the wire and the behavior of the wire to make sure it's taking the right course. So after we were able to go through this, and we went about five to six times all the way up this way, we were able to get some good flow, and then, of course, here's what we pulled out, which you don't want in your body. And as you'd expect, he felt a lot better uh, after the procedure, and that, that went quite well. Note that, though, 350 milliliters of blood loss, and, and you're going to get that. So if you're doing a device that's going to pull out a lot of clot, it's also going to pull out some blood. Another case here got a little bit more of an issue, and the focus of this case was basically the same kind of clinical scenario. Somebody who can't bear weight, was very symptomatic, had an extensive amount of clot, and no <laughs> flow based on ultrasound that we could see. Um, but the issue became a little bit longer, right? So two weeks is generally what we establish as a time threshold for an acute DVT, and this was going right past that. But he was quite symptomatic. We wanted to give it a try, so we went in. In this particular case, we used the bold. So there's the clot river bold. It has 30% more tensile strength, which uh, might give you a little bit more leverage to get more clot out if you need to. So getting in here, you could see not very much in terms of movement. We did get above. There wasn't anything that I was worried about in the IVC. But the part that I want to highlight here is that we, despite using the clock retriever at this point four times going up and down with some discomfort, as you can imagine, because veins are sensitive, and we talked about that earlier, didn't get too much <coughs> of a benefit past this point. So we actually went in there and we ended up ballooning. And I think this is the highlight of this point that I want to make, is that when you get into that situation, inline flow is really what it's at. So this patient, despite the fact of having the least amount of clot that we were able to pull out of the body, ended up doing phenomenally well and was able to see me in clinic three months later doing well on that leg. Um, other things you can consider from that same point is that you could consider IVIS, you can consider stenting. We don't do that on index acute DVT events in our center. Uh, we just feel like the, the, the data there is, is muddy and, and it's a little bit to gray. Um, so we aren't going to do it until they fail anticoagulation for a second time. This is the last one that I just wanted to show you. What do you do when everything is clotted? So this is the IVC down that's clotted, and in this particular case, we ended up using a 20 French pro tree, which is essentially a, a, a accessible filter that we placed down in from the IJ. Ended up getting access from above and below, and basically going through with both systems on a clot retriever 20 on the left side, as well as the flow retriever. But it's just to say that in certain scenarios, this may be a useful device when you're completely done. I think the highlight of what we want to say is pretty simple. Patients are the most important in what we do. We should be beholden to them on that. If they're symptomatic and they cannot do basic things like bear weight, that would be the reason I would treat an acute DVT, not for post-thrombotic syndrome. And being in line with flow is the ultimate goal, not getting clots out of the body necessarily. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We have a couple of minutes uh, for panel discussion and audience participation. I think it would be great to have a couple questions for our last two or three speakers. I, I, I just have a few things. You know, I was thinking about all the nice talks that we had. A um, few comments. On the May-Thurner syndrome, we're currently calling it iliac vein compression because May-Thurner is mostly that, you know, common iliac on the left that's, you know, compressed by the left common iliac artery. And because of all the seven other variants that we have, we're tending to call it more iliac vein compression. On the general anesthesia debate, if I'm working on a nivel lesion, meaning non-thrombotic iliac vein lesion, with, meaning no DVT, I don't put my patients under a general anesthesia. 
Reason is I worry about those iliac veins getting a little smaller and me undersizing my stent. I want them to be awake. I want to give them a lot of fluids. I give them a liter of fluid before I take them to the cath lab and make sure I'm sizing it right. The way I size my stents, <clears throat> I look at the common iliac before the lesion, within the lesion, and after the lesion, and I make six measurements. And I make sure that my stent is, is touching at least four of those six. That way your, your stent migration risk will be much lower. <clears throat> because sometimes you have a 22 by nine, and you, cannot, you're not, you can't size it that, you know, in between. So you have to make sure that all the walls are touching at least four out of, out of the six. And the goal I reach when I'm stenting those iliac veins I want to reach a 200 to 250 millimeter square of surface on my ivus in the common iliac, 150 to, 100 to 200 on the external iliac, and 120 or so on the common femoral, uh, common femoral vein. I think getting the goal to reach that surface using ivus is more important than just putting stents at 14, 16, or 10, 12. Um, in those areas. And I'm not going to say that I always reach those goals because sometimes you have so much clot and so much fibrous tissue to where reaching that amount of uh, surface is difficult, but that should be the goal. Yeah, I think, uh, so I'll just say a little, I think we're learning so much on the venous space with the nivels. Um, I think for sure, I think what Dr. Huff was describing was that really complex iliocable reconstruction kind of case. Correct. I mean, those patients need a general in my practice as well, so I agree. But I think for the straightforward cases, for sure, some acute DVTs with a focal lesion, for sure, if you can, depending on the patient. I think the challenge, um, and I've learned this over the last uh, few cases, is with the awake patient. I think actually it's very different to hold breath, awake patient, hold breath, asleep patient. What happens with the asleep patient is it's passive, right? Anesthesia is doing it for you. So there's no use of accessory muscles, abdominal wall muscles, and you just get a very different uh, evaluation of the vein. Awake patient, lots of accessory muscles, lots of abdominal wall muscle use, and they tend to collapse. So you get this, you get this like paradoxical collapse of the vein. And that may actually make your measurements a little bit more challenging to interpret. Um, so I actually think in, uh, going to the external iliac vein is um, like a good landing zone because you, you won't deal with that presynodic dilatation also. Because um, as we know from the migration issue, the short stents are, you know, if you're not long enough, that's one of the, the risk factors. But very, lots of different things when you're looking at a patient, whether they're asleep or awake, like really take the time to do fixed evaluation. Like park your IVUS, take a look. Move the IVUS, park it again, take another look. Think about what your patient scenario is. Are they prone or supine? You get fooled with prone scenarios, especially in the groin. You'll have external compression from all kinds of other things. You lift the hip, compression gone. Again, these are all things, just tips and tricks to kind of consider. Uh, great points. I think um, nivel lesions, you can't size your stent to the size of the pre-stenotic dilatation. That is a bad move. Um, you're going to go long, place in the external iliac. The vessel will remodel. If you were to bring it back in angio and six months later, it will have remodeled. A couple other points. If you're going to use wall stents, remember they're weak on the ends. So it will necessitate you putting that stent a little more in the IVC than you would the newer venous stents. And that's actually why I've gone away from them, because that does carry some risk of contralateral iliac vein thrombosis. With the newer stents designed for the iliac veins, they're strong on the ends, so you can be more acute with them. The other thing I'll say, sorry, last point, is that there are a few cases where the case was done and then the CT afterwards showed a mass in the pelvis, and now a stent has already been placed. The problem with that is often it's a new diagnosis and now they need biopsy and now they need all kinds of other things and you have them on plavix and anticoagulation. So just have a very low threshold for axial imaging and iliac DVT prior to intervention. And if you get in there in IVUS and you see external compression from a mass, it's okay to stop. It's okay to stop, get imaging and come back. So. I think I, I agree with Chris on this. You know, the, the nice thing is we're not really debating whether intravascular imaging is necessary or not. It is necessary, mandatory, and obligatory in deep vein uh, work. And what we learn from intravascular imaging is the concept of nailing the osseum is not common. It's either we miss or we protrude, and I would rather protrude a little bit and make sure that I have accurate osseal coverage. Now, on the other, on the other point, I've done these venograms, I've done IVUS, something doesn't make sense, it's not right, I would low threshold to stop and get a CT scan. Sometimes um, 
it can be treated one case with uh, hysterectomy from large adenomyosis or uh, urinary retention that was compressing the iliac veins. So very low threshold for stuff. That was, that was good work. This is awesome. I think the intention of this format was to initiate the discussion. And I think the moderators and panelists have brought out such sentinel points, I think, which are going to be pearls uh, when we go into our lab. So thank you. Let's continue. Uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. So now um, we will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Yulenka Castro Dominguez, who uh, is one of our colleagues as well and a partner of ours from University Hospitals Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. She'll be speaking to us about PERT, catheter based thrombolysis, or non lytic based approach for pulmonary embolism. Woo! <laughs> you have a lot of fans. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I pay them a little bit. <laughs> Okay. Thank you guys for having me. So we'll be talking about a uh, couple of things. Now, this is my topic to talk about per catheterlysis and non lytic based approach. But we'll try to. There's, that's a lot to cover. But we'll try to have a few uh, few items there. Oh, you're trying to find me with a camera. Okay, yeah. sorry. Okay, so we'll we'll start with a case. This is a 51 year old woman with history of knee replacement three weeks prior, who was brought to the emergency room with complaints of fatigue, shortness of breath, and multiple multiple syncopal episodes at home. Uh, the family was actually kept passing out. We don't know what's going on. Uh, as noted, she had a knee replacement three weeks prior and was placed on aspirin only for uh, prophylaxis. Non-smoker, no family history of venous thromboembolism. Uh, on exam, uh, the way the ED described it is that she does not look well. She's lethargic, she has cyanotic lips, uh, she's tachycardic with a heart rate of the 120 to the 130s. She's normal tensive, her blood pressure is fine, however, she's pretty hypoxic and requiring a non rebreather of 15 liters in order to keep her SATs. And in her initial labs, her troponin was elevated, BMP was elevated, and lactate as well. Uh, and we can appreciate her image in here. Um, I don't know if it will let me play. Yeah, good, perfect. Uh, we can see the presence of a big saddle PE with a large, large amount of clot on the left side, an obscene amount of clot on the left side that's occlusive, uh, as well as the presence of a, a pulmonary infarct as well on the, on the right. And with an evidence of RV strain, we can see on her echo, her RV is quite big um, um, with, uh, with hypokinesis, uh, and it's pretty dilated, uh, which is overall pretty concerning. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about, I know this is an, an interventional conference, but the main thing with patients coming in with PE is understanding their risk. So I th the overall first step when we're managing patients with PE, it's a wider range, it's a wide presentation. So we need to understand first how to re-stratify them and identify which factors elevate her risk. So based on this presentation, if anyone can tell me, how would you... Uh, how would you re stratify this patient? Is she low risk, moderate risk, high risk? Good, she's tachycardic, right? Um, you know, so, what, so we would definitely think that she's on the high risk side, of course. Now, the next question was which factors, which are the, which are the terms, which are the things that are coming up with her that, that you think, which are the factors that elevate her risk? Which factors? What things in her presentation? Good. Syncope. What else? Her vitals were absolutely scoring. Yeah, when she was taking more than one ten, I fucked it less than ninety, and that adds to her present scores. Correct. Good. So her vitals, so hemodynamics, is pretty tachycardic. She's hypoxic, and some of her labs as well. So it's really important to identify those are risk factors. Important for you guys to hear that nobody's talking about a, her risk, about her club burden, right? We don't look at the imaging in terms of, oh, this is such saddle, such a big PE, so bad. That's not a massive PE. You can have a saddle PE and still be stable and, not, and need being, you can be very well be treated with anticoagulation at all. It's about how the RV is handling that club burden and how the patient is responding hemodynamically to it. And that's the important part. Okay, so as we talk, factors that reflect higher risk are syncope, altered mental status, tachycardia, her oxygen requirement, her elevated troponin BMP, and her elevated lactate. And there are many risk scores that help us stratify and identify which patients are on the high risk category. Uh, and based on her PESI score, BOVA score, she's on the very high risk, high risk end. Now, why is this important for us to risk stratify patients with PE? Um, because there's a, there's a number of patients like this patient, she's normal tensive, right? But she's on the high risk end, why? Uh, she has RV dysfunction, and this group of patients are at increased risk of adverse outcomes. 
Um, and there's some uh, reports that tell us that in this group of patients, the mortality can go up to 20%. And it's our job as the frontline of uh, providers that look at these patients to identify which patients are high risk of the compensation. Because there is a subset of intermediate risk patients that will develop hypotension, shock, and sudden death. And that's our job to try to identify them in order to offer interventions that might benefit. And as you guys see in this table, we know who are the low-risk patients. We can identify those high-risk patients based, based on hypotension, hemodynamic instability. But is this number of, of intermediate risk patients that can present diversely, and we need to identify who, who are those that may benefit from an intervention. And that's why the PER teams exist, because based on your local multidisciplinary expertise, that may include vascular medicine, pulmonary critical care, um, intervention cardiology, IR, surgery, based on everyone's expertise, it can come with a table and identify which are those patients that may benefit from additional intervention and may benefit from further management. So in her case, uh, based on her oxygen requirement, her tachycardia, and all those factors that identify as high risk, uh, we definitely thought that she would benefit from an intervention. And we proceeded with, with thrombectomy using the flow tuber device. And as we can see, pre-procedure, she was you know, requiring a lot of support. Um, uh, and with elevated PA pressures, and post-procedure to remove the uh, majority of her clot. Uh, her oxygen saturation improved, heart rate improved, and hemodynamics improved as well. And we see improvement as well. Her, this is her echo just the day after. With significant improvement in her RV, uh, she was able to be discharged on day three after presenting with significant instability initially. Uh, and then in follow-up with her echo, she had normal RV size and function as well. Now, this is a second case of a 55-year-old woman who presented with shortness of breath and also had a syncopal episode at home um, and no history of VTE. On vital, she's tachycardic, normal tensive as well, but also hypoxic with elevated troponin, elevated BMP, and elevated lactate as well. And when you see her CT, she has bilateral PEs. Okay, not as impressive as her prior uh, imaging, but she still has... Um, uh, club burden that's causing RV dysfunction uh, in, and uh, tachycardia and hypoxia in her case. And when we look at her echo, her RV is dilated with uh, some evidence of dysfunction as well. Now, in her case, how would we restratify this patient? What do we think? Low risk, moderate risk, intermediate, high. Yeah, take it. she's not as bad as her first one, right? But but just take it carded. Yeah. That's a good that's a good thought, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's relative based on her baseline blood pressure. Her blood pressure is kind of soft, but she's take it cardic, absolutely. Um so on the bow score that adds to her scoring system as well. Correct. Good, good. Again, those are all the factors that we're looking for to identify who would benefit from, uh, from additional help, additional intervention. And, and sometimes we try to see how these patients will do an anticoagulation alone with heparin and see how their response would be. In her case, um, you know, after even you know, just 24 hours of anticoagulation, she continued to be tachycardic and not responding well, reason why, um, uh, uh, in her case, we decided to proceed with intervention as well. Did her symptoms start suddenly, or, uh, or is there more of chronicity to her symptoms? Yeah, that's a good question. So in her case, it was more of a, was more of a week of symptoms in her case, yeah. Now, why that question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I saw some pericardial effusion. I was wondering right. about the chronicity good. of it. Good, good, good thought. Good thought. Yeah, and that's important to know. There's some patients that present with more chronic symptoms of our underlying pulmonary hypertension um, or underlying disease that may reflect more of a chronic component. Uh, so in her case, one of her thoughts was, okay, so she's definitely not tolerating whatever is happening. Her club burden is not as bad, but is mainly distal. Uh, so it's mainly distal. Uh, and our thought was we, you know, she's proven that after 24, you know, 24, 48 hours of anticoagulation alone, she still, she still needs some additional help. 
uh, in order to improve. So the reason why we offered intervention, and in her case, given her more distal club burden, we actually uh, preferred to use uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis in order to treat more of that distal, uh, distal disease, distal uh, club burden. Uh, so we did um, ECOS catheters placed in bilateral PAs to, from right IJ approach, six hour infusion of TPA, one milligram per hour, uh, and she had significant improvement. She was able to be weaned to Romare on the following day, and then was able to transition to our anticoagulation and was discharged on day four of admission. So just what are the take home points? Patients with intermediate high risk PE are at a high risk of adverse event. And our job is to identify which patients, a lot of patients will do well with anticoagulation at all, but our job is to identify which patients might need additional help in order to prevent adverse events and in order to help them with, to have a faster recovery. The reason why we need, uh, we can use three stratification tools, imaging, and multidisciplinary expertise is so important uh, to identify the best management approach in a case-by-case -case basis. There's no one algorithm that will tell you what to do with each PE patient, but definitely the, the multidisciplinary expertise will help identify what's best for each patient. And again, the selection of advanced therapies depends on the assessment of the patient's risk of adverse outcomes. Any questions? I have... Um... So the second case, especially there is not very large load, and why not IV TBA? That's a good question. So uh, he's mentioning the use of IV TBA, systemic TBA. Um, one of the concerns with systemic TBA is the high risk of bleeding, right, with systemic TBA. So we can use catheter-directed lysis and do more directed therapy, use lower dose of uh, TBA, and potentially reduce the risk of bleeding. But actually, the uh, complication as bleeding is extremely low, yeah. very low. And even for the high dose and the low dose, the 100 milligram and the 50 milligram, it is one, less than one person, major bleed, mm -hmm. minor bleeds, if you want to call them, especially if they have lines, 5% only. Mm -hmm. And they hardly bleed. Uh, and much faster, so you don't have to take patient, do anything. That's a good thought, and still a therapy that we use. However, one of the things that are concerning, especially in different type of patients, is we want to try to minimize the bleeding risk. So identifying in each patient what their presentation is and what their bleeding risk is important. Great presentation. Thanks for the question. We have um, a, a period for panel discussion shortly for both cases as well, and at this time we'll move on to Dr. Chadi Deb. He will be uh, speaking about a case of complex venous filter retrieval. He's joining us from Baylor, Texas. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Um, so those are my disclosures. Um, I'm going to go over a quick case. Um, this is a 28-year-old gentleman with a past medical history, significant for obesity. He did have an unprovoked large right lower extremity DVT complicated with PE and corpulmonar. That was, um, you know, due to the extent of the clot, um, an IVC filter was placed at the time. He uh, was last to follow up and came in around 18 months later and was continued to be on anticoagulation that was continued to be refilled by his primary care physician. Um, when we saw him, we, um, I, you know, we, we, uh, he was sent for IVC filter removal the first time before I got to meet with, with him. Um, this is the first attempt, and as you can see, we have a 12 French sheath here, and they had a um, snare, and they attempted to snare this multiple times, but they, that would not go in. He, was, he came back for a second attempt, and in this attempt, there are multiple ways to try to remove an IVC filter. On this attempt, what they did is they got a, a, a 14 French sheath all the way down, and they got a sheath from below, and they tried to balloon the IVC filter to try to move it away from uh, the wall, because they thought it's probably embedded. The hook of that filter, the Cook filter, is likely embedded in the wall. So they tried multiple times with multiple um, ballooning attempts and then tried to snare it with a different snare technique. Again, um, they were unable to do so. At that point, I saw him in my clinic for uh, probably a third attempt. 
And what we did, we first started with the CTA or CTV of the abdomen. And you can see the hook of that filter. I'm not sure if I can point to it here. The hook of that filter is going posteriorly closer to the spine. That's the tip of it. And you can see it on the other one. It's kind of bent posteriorly. And there's a little leg of the filter that's pointing out anteriorly through that IVC. So knowing the anatomy here is extremely important for IVC filter uh, retrieval um, in this case. So the biggest question is, what is the indication? Because this is going to be a patient that we're you know, having a third attempt to try to remove this filter from. Um, definitely, if you keep the IVC filter in, there's an increased risk of thrombus to the IVC and to both iliac veins. There's an increased risk of PTS later on. The filter can penetrate and cause pain and erode through the abdominal structures. A filter can fracture and embolize to multiple areas. If it does go up to the pulmonary artery, retrieval is not extremely easy, but it's not extremely difficult either. If it does embolize into the RV, it is much more difficult um, to retrieve it because you have a lot of papillary muscles and it's pretty difficult to get um, a snare through without causing cardiac injury. If they have symptoms, relief of symptoms, and a lot of patients, because of the IVC filter thrombus risk, are, you know, stay on long-term anticoagulation. This patient is a 28-year-old patient, so we don't want to leave him on it for too long. Definitely, there are risks to IVC filter removal. In good and experienced centers, those risks, that risk goes down to 2%. Um, but there's definitely a risk of hemorrhage in the uh, IVC, or thrombosis, arterial hemorrhage, and other other risks as noted here. There are a few techniques to um, retrieve an IVC filter. Um, you can have the loop snare technique where you loop a catheter around the tip of that hook and retrieve it that way. Try to pull it out from within the wall and then snare it out. There is definitely the rigid, rigid endobronchial forceps that can definitely go in and you kind of slowly um, uh, feel that wall of the IVC and try to dissect into the uh, hook and retrieve it that way, and there is definitely, at the end there, the laser. Definitely all those techniques are pretty um, intense and, um, you know, have a lot of risk doing them. So you have to do that, uh, at least that forceps, extremely slowly if you want to do this. When he came back to see um, us in, in the cath lab, we did the wire loop technique. So you can see the wire... Um, looped around the IVC hook. And when we tried to pull that wire back, the entire sheath was coming in, and we were unable to really take it off the wall as nicely as we would dissect usually in those cases. Um, after a few attempts, we thought, let's try to snare it and see if we, if we you know, moved that hook off the wall, and we were unable to do so. We called for the endobronchial forceps, rigid forceps, but we did not have it. Now, you have to remember this is a third attempt. This is not a second or first attempt. So we have to um, kind of find something else to do to be able to get that hook off the wall. So what we did is we called for a cardiac biopsy forceps. Um, so we got the forceps down to the IVC and started nibbling into the IVC wall slowly and trying to get that hook off the um, the wall and try to, to kind of catch it if we can. And if you look at that third one, we caught it at the end. And when we caught it, we got the sheath down and we did a 180 degree angle on the camera to make sure, on the II, to make sure that the uh, hook is within the sheath and then we retrieved it nicely. So this is when we, we felt that we got it. We got the hook, we got the sheath down slowly. And after we got the sheath down, we moved the camera to make sure we have it all in. You will see there the change, and that we know that kind of in three, three, three dimensions we have it, and it was retrieved easily. And after that, we did a quick IVC venogram that showed that everything is out without any significant problems to the IVC. Now, I thought if I have a minute, which I do, I'm gonna show you a quick complication from IVC filter. Um, this is another 67-year-old lady who came to see me with uh, PTS and IVC thrombosis. She, she had seen a colleague of mine who told her there is not much to do, but after she was referred to me, I thought, let's go in and 
see what is happening to the IVC and iliac veins, and we can tell the entire IVC, you know, below the renal veins, it seems to be occluded, and there's an IVC filter there. Retrieving that one was done through a forceps, and it was not very difficult, honestly, to retrieve. But after we retrieved it, we had to reconstruct the entire IVC, um, which we did here in the third image with, at the time, Vici stents that were, you know, still available. Um, so basically, the removal, the tips for removing an IVC filter, you have, we have to all, always acknowledge that in a retrospective analysis, I looked at all those IVC filters. Apparently, if you have an IVC filter for seven months or more, 40% of the times you fail to remove it using a normal snare technique. So you always have to have other techniques available for re retrieval. A CTA or CTV of the abdomen CTV basically is extremely helpful prior to IVC filter. It will tell you where the legs are, are they going in to any abdominal structures, and if the hook of that IVC is pointing towards uh, inside the wall. And, you know, definitely removing the IVC filters and centers of expertise sometimes results in better overall success rate. Thank you. We are just a few minutes over time, but if we have a couple of questions, I think I'd start with um, indications for a filter in patients who can be anticoagulated. Are there times when you prefer to put these in, or in this case, maybe we shouldn't have had that filter to begin with? That would I be, say, that'd be my first question. You know, I personally think, you know, definitely if you have an acute DVT and you can't put them on anticoagulation, that would be the only... Uh, indication for IVC filter replacement, although controversial, but that would be the only indication. Um, um, sometimes, you know, they call you for preoperative um, um, prevention of DVT and PE, and in those cases, I always say no. But, um, you know, I think the only current indication that I think is, is decent is lack of anticoagulation in the presence of acute DVT. One other question for our panelists. Do your institutions have a way to track these filters? In my mind, the person who puts it in should own it. So to have a filter in 18 months later, how do we do a better job getting these out? Yeah, we, we track these very closely. So we have uh, over 95% retrieval rate, and the ones that don't come out are patients who die or move away. So we track every filter we put in, we own them. As my really old ex-colleague, Gary Ansel, used to say, the problem is not filter placement, it's lack of retrieval. And so I think that if you're going to put it in, you have to own it, you have to get it out. I want to say one more thing. The other time I will put in a filter, besides inability to anticoagulate, is someone who tries to die from a PE who has a ton of residual. Um, because I can tell you, that may not be a clear-cut indication, but if you have cleaned someone out, sent them upstairs, and they have re-embolized on you, it takes five seconds to put a filter in. And as long as you're tracking it closely and get it out, you save yourself a lot of heartache. So, and when I say a lot of residual, I'm talking about residual iliac. You don't want to attack it right now. You know, they're too sick. You're lucky to have gotten out of the cath lab from the PE. I'm not talking about a thumb pop DVT. So we do, we do have a system to track these people in our institution. Uh, we have a registry that we maintain, and we have a follow-up one month and three months just to make sure they don't fall off our radar, and we usually end up taking them at follow-up. So we have almost whatever I put in, I've taken it 100%. So we actually have 20% retrieval because we lose most of the patients, especially trauma and others, once they discharge the hospital. This is a problem. I had a question about laser. Is it a game changer in filter removal? I Anybody? think it is. You know, some, the, the issue with the filters sometimes is that the lower legs get stuck in, within the wall, and, and, you know, a lot of fibrotic tissue comes you know, over them, and it becomes hard for you to remove them. The biggest um, thing is when you're trying to remove those filters and you apply around six pounds of pressure backward to, to get them out, that's the max you should be able to apply on it if you look at it digitally, if you do have a digital um, way to, to track it. When you get the filter over that sheath, that, uh, that uh, fil uh, I mean, when you get the laser over the filter, the power that you have to retrieve it goes from six to three. So you're not really putting a lot of 
pressure onto that IVC and collapsing it, and you know, the risk of IVC rupture becomes much smaller or lower. The only way, though, to do the, uh, the laser atherectomy is you have to, to snare it. You have to have the IVC uh, filter snared your laser uh, sheath over it, and then you can do it. But the laser itself is a game changer from the perspective of less, less force to retrieve that IVC. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Well, but do you, would you routinely then use uh, laser? No, a lot of times it, it just comes out with a, some, yeah. some, you know, some form of force, but you don't want to apply too much force to where you rupture the IVC is kind of what it is, yeah. Please, thank you. Sorry, I think a, a long-dwelling Gunther tulip filter, you're almost always going to have to use laser to get that out. A long-dwelling Optis, Trepis filters, you're going to have to use laser to get those out. Bards tend to come out very nicely. Um, without the use of filter, so, without the use of laser, sir. So I, I think you, you brought a question about uh, the indication for IVC filter, but what's surprising is if you ask any interventionist who does those cases, we still wonder why Optis still exist or type Z still exist. It exists because the six French, you can put it from a radial vein, brachial vein, but those are the ones that really we see more and more of occlusion, more of a nasty occlusion. And, for those, what we do now is we, if we have an occlusion, you reconstruct through the filter, hoping that you can have a nice expansion. Here's the problem with that. Um, no matter, if you put a 16, 216 millimeter diameter uh, Aubrey stent, for example, and you post dilate them, when you IVIS afterward, you will never expand more than eight. So you're never getting the nominal. So those cases, if you want to stent them, better to take that filter out first and reassess the patient like uh, what they showed. You're saying that specifically with Optees, though, not with a conventional tulip type. Cor filter. Correct. Yeah. I think the data, I think we'll probably need still more data on laser versus other approaches. Um, oftentimes, I, I'm kind of eager to use it too, but then find that the endobronchial forceps is just a fine job. And most of these, you can, con like if there's a bleed, you can control them with balloon tamponade. Um, but there are ways to use the endobronchial forceps and the laser. There's a one that's, uh, like everything nowadays, is on back order. But there is a smaller caliber one that fits, so you don't have to worry about doing the loop. Because uh, getting the loop correctly in the right angle is challenging. You don't know which direction and which plane that loop is forming in, and then it's hard to get it into that laser sheath. Um, but I think most cases, it's, it's not needed, at least in my practice. You can do it with an endobronchial forceps. If I can throw one thing out here. Um, these sound like, I'm not an interventionalist, these sound like relatively challenging cases. They're probably not for the novice person to try up front. Am I, am I correct on this? This is for somebody with experience using these devices and somebody who's done these cases supervised, correct? Yeah, there's a lot of subtleties in the venous space. I mean, you're talking about non-thrombotics, then chronic, and then how long is the chronic, and you got to really kind of prepare for everything. I mean, it's hard to show up to game day and you don't have the right stents or the right devices or the right uh, balloons, because these are big balloons, and are you coming jugular or femoral, and you, things are almost on a 75 shaft or an 85 shaft. You can't get there from the, to the cava from the pop, and you got to think about all these things, and, and so, um, yeah, these are definitely cases that require time and experience. And I think Dr. Huff mentioned earlier, diagnostic venogram, the role of that in the chronic patient. I mean, I, to me, that's my roadmap. And then I can plan, get everything ready, consult with my friends, do whatever I have to do. Um, so again, these are not things you want to rush into. Yeah. All right. Uh, Subash, do you have something to say? No, Otherwise, we're say about 10, 12 minutes over. I was going to... I think this is fantastic. First of all, uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm sure everyone did. I do want to say that thank you to the two moderators and also the panelists for going first, because my and Mehdi's session is second. So we had a great opportunity to put you as guinea pigs and see how this runs out and iron out all the kinks from the AE side. So thank you very much. Take a bathroom and a coffee break, and then we'll reassemble in about 20 minutes. Thank you so much.